In Genesis 11 is the Tower of Babel incident. And although humanity was instructed by God after the flood to disperse and fill the whole earth, many came together to build a city and a tower which would reach the heavens so they could make a name for themselves, they said. This was in defiance of God's instructions and God came down to disperse them. And they did this by confusing their language. But in the very next chapter we see, chapter 12, that the Lord tells Abraham to leave all that you know, your family, your friends, the land that you know, and follow me into a land, a new land. And I will make your name great. In you, he says, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And Abraham, Abraham left, and he followed the Lord. His greatness came not from himself, but from God. He exemplified a servant of the Lord, and he became a light in the darkness for the world. Last week, we ended a two-part series on identity, both for Jesus and his followers. And it started also the new series that we're going into on discipleship. And this one's going to go for a while. This one will bring us basically right up to the triumphant entry into Jerusalem by Jesus. So last week we learned that the Son of God, or the Son of Man, who is Jesus, both are names for him, comes down from the mountaintop where he was in power and in glory. No sin was there whatsoever. And in order for him to have mercy on the sons of humanity, like we saw also last week that the man at the bottom of the mountain had the son that was demonically overwhelmed by and was asking, have mercy on my son. In order for that to happen, Jesus must become a sacrifice, taking on humanity's due wrath upon himself. He must suffer. There's a suffering world and a sinless heaven. And in order for those two to be joined again, those two are going to have to meet. So Jesus is frustrated. We also saw last week with his disciples for the lack of their faith. And he tells them if they have just even small faith, it can move mountains, the biggest obstacles before them. And then we also saw that Jesus is the Son of God and that those who belong to him will follow him into death even, and be raised up into life, transformed. So we're, today we're going to look at three sections which expose where greatness is found in the kingdom of heaven. The first section is the son of man who suffers. So as they were gathering in Galilee... Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day, and they were greatly distressed. So they're now in Jesus' Jesus' native area, Galilee. Jesus is about to, the word means destined or inevitable, so he is about to be delivered over handed over is what this word means, entrusted to, betrayed, or arrested. Any of those is what this word means. So humanity's representative, that's what son of man means, the representative of mankind. Ezekiel was called that by God, the son of man. Their representative will be given to humanity. And what will they do with this gift? They'll kill him. They'll try to destroy him and eliminate him, but it won't work. He will rise up, get up from the dead is what that word means. So Jesus willingly surrendered, knowing his betrayal was definite, and God allowed it. This is Jesus' second time of prophesying his death and resurrection, and we know, we've learned about the importance of numbers. So how many times do you think he's going to probably say this? It's the second, though, one. Oh, and then we see on here, on the third day. 
On the third day, last week we saw three disciples went up the mountain and met three witnesses, right? Moses, Elijah, and the Father, God, who was exemplified by the voice in the cloud, all gave witness to Jesus that he is the Son of God as well. And in Matthew 12, 40, we also saw that Jesus said, as Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days, Jesus will be in the heart of the earth also three days. So also, this is all supposed to be remembered, especially the mountaintop experience from last week. When the three, the same three, Peter, James, and John, will be in the garden with Jesus and also separated from the rest of them. And they will go with Jesus again to seek the Father, but this time in the garden no answer will be given, unlike at the top of the mountain. It's to remind us that the Son of God was glorified on the mountain, but in the garden, which is symbolic of Eden, where sin came into the world, where humanity rebelled against God, the Son will be abandoned to sin. In the same place that sin came into the world will be the beginning of its abolishment also. Peter, James, and John were with Jesus when he was revealed as the light and they will be with him when he is given over to the darkness as well. They were greatly distressed, greatly grieved because of our lack of faith and obedience in the garden. Sin has taken us captive. It owns us. And suffering is the result of all of that. That's how suffering has come into the world. So the Son of Man came to heal and teach and to reveal God and instruct us how to follow Him. But it also was to free humanity from their bondage to sin. The only way to forgiveness is through a substitutionary sacrifice. And in the story of Abraham, Abraham was instructed to put his son Isaac, the son of promise, the miracle child, up on an altar to sacrifice him to God. This is where all of us are destined for before God since sin came in death. Genesis 22, 2, God says to Abraham, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, your beloved one, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him up as a burnt offering. Last week, God said in Matthew 17, verse 5, this is my beloved son. So let me go back. He said, take your beloved son, Abraham, and sacrifice him. And in Matthew 17, 5, God says, this is my beloved son here. He identifies him. But God stopped Abraham and provided a substitutionary sacrifice in Isaac's place. As a, as a summary of, of Genesis 22, it says, After three days, there it is again, they came to the mountain, Mount Moriah. And Abraham, the father, took the wood for the burnt offering, and he laid it on his son, Isaac. And in his hand carried the fire and the knife. And they both went together up on that mountain. And Isaac asks, Dad, where's the sacrifice? Imagine that pain in that moment. And Abraham says, God will provide my son. The angel of the Lord stops Abraham right before he slaughters Isaac. And he says, now I know you fear God, not even withholding your son from me. And in Genesis 22, 13 through 14, Abraham lifted up his eyes, he said, it says, and he looked and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. That's what Moriah means. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Mount Moriah is where the temple of the Lord was built. 
and Jesus was sacrificed right outside that temple. The same mountain. So the Son of God took the place of the sons of men as their representative, the Son of Man. And He provided, God provided on that mountain just like He promised. And in Genesis 22, verses 15 through 18, it says that the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven. And he said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gates of its enemy. Last week, or recently, wasn't that when God or Jesus said that not even the gates of hell will prevail over my church? And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice, because you had faith in my word. All of humanity will benefit from the descendant, the one of Abraham, the Christ. A substitutionary sacrifice which will be provided on the mount of the Lord and it will be the Lord's son. Deep suffering will take place. All of this is supposed to capture that, that deep suffering. Was it easy for God to give his son over as a sacrifice to humanity? No. Incredible pain, incredible suffering. But he knew and he did want to do it because it was the only way. It was the only way to take suffering out of the equation. He took it on himself. Who of us would be willing to sacrifice our own child? Horrifying. Horrifying. That's why some people don't even like looking at that text because it's so horrifying. But in it is where we see the beauty of the cross also. The willingness of God to go that far for his people. We can never say with truth. We can say it, but we can never say it in any truth that God doesn't understand my pain. God doesn't understand what I'm going through. He doesn't care. When we look back to the cross and you really look at it, it's impossible to honestly make that statement. Jesus was willing to suffer in, for the life of others and to him it was all worth it. He willingly did it. His suffering brings the presence of God to us like never before and we are never alone. Are we willing to face suffering, this world of suffering with God in ministry in his likeness? Because that's what he calls us into. Pick up your cross and follow me daily. But he also says, I will never leave you. I'm doing it with you. And it will be worth it. Because it will bring life to many. Number two, the son of man, the servant. When they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax went up to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the tax? And he said, yes. And when he came to the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, what do you think, Simon? From who do kings of the earth take their toll or tax? From their sons or from others? So Capernaum is where faithlessness has already been illuminated in the gospel. And it is on the Sea of Galilee. The, sens the census tax is something that we see that was given in Exodus 30, verses 11 through 16. It says that the Lord said to Moses, when you take the census of the people of Israel, then each shall give a ransom for his life to the Lord. Then you will number them, that there will be no plague among them when you number them. Each one who is numbered in the census shall give a half a shekel, as an offering to the Lord. You shall take the atonement money from the people of Israel and shall give it to the service for the tent of meeting. Ultimately, it's the tabernacle. 
that it may bring the people of Israel to remembrance before the Lord so as to make atonement for your lives. So this tax was used for atonement, for sin, number one. Jesus was without sin, number one. And number two, it's to be used for the service of the tabernacle. The tabernacle was to house the presence of the Lord, number one. And Jesus is the presence of the Lord. You could argue that he is the tabernacle. In fact, even the book of John says that he was tabernacled among us. He walked among us. That's what that word means. So Peter answers the collector's question quickly. Yes, of course Jesus pays this tax. But Jesus knows Peter's response before Peter even gets back. And he's going to teach him. He says, are king's sons taxed also? Or do they get a pass? Is it the people of the kingdom that are taxed? Or are the sons also included in that tax? And when Peter said, from others, Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. However, do not give offense to them. Go to the sea and cast a hook and take the first fish that comes up and when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Remember, it was a half a shekel for each person. Take that and give it to them for me and yourself. So Peter confirms that the sons of kings of the earth are not taxed. They are free from it. They're exempt. And Jesus is exposing clearly here that the Son of God does not need to pay this tax either. But this is fascinating. He says, don't give offense to them. Don't cause them to sin is what this phrase means. That you may not make them stumble. That you do not make them rebel against God. All of that is what this phrase means. So even though Jesus is right not to pay this tax, he bends to meet them where they are. But God loves us so much, he would never, ever leave us there. He's bringing us to understand and live in a right relationship with him. Jesus shows us that he's God. I love this. <laughs> he does it so... Huh? Instead of him just saying, oh, what's this behind your ear, Peter? Oh, look, I found a shekel. Here, go ahead and just give this to him. No, he has him go out to the sea. Cast a hook into the sea, which is... Interesting because the sea we've talked about is actually symbolic of, of evil, wickedness that crashes, the waves crash against the boundaries that God has set for it, right? The land. So go even to that. And even out of that, he has power even over that. Throw your hook in and the first fish that you catch <clears throat> will have the perfect amount that we need to get in or to pay this tax. <laughs> Open it up and the shekel will be in the mouth. It's almost like he's showing off a little bit, right? Nobody can do that. You can't say, it's witchcraft. No, it shows that he is over all of creation. He's over the sea. He's over the fish. He's over it all. There's nothing that is more powerful than him. It's all under his feet. He truly is king He's showing us who's God and who's not. There's been times in my life where I knew that I was biblically correct in my opinion. If I'm not, I won't go to I won't fight a battle unless if I know that I'm re, if I know I'm really right on it then there's been times where I've taken my stand pretty hardcore. And I remember a couple of times doing that. And I remember God asking me this, because I prayed. I said, God, if I'm not right, then tell me, show me, and I'll be humble and I'll, I'll repent and I'll change. I didn't expect the answer that he gave me. He didn't tell me I was wrong in my opinion. He did tell me I was wrong in my approach. He said to me, did I bend when I met you? 
in your fallen list? I just hung my head and said a lot, a lot. And he said, well, maybe you could turn and return this favor to some others. Bend to meet them where they are and then show them so that they might understand what you're saying and bring them closer to me. That's a servant, not a ruler, not someone that says, I know what's right and declare righteousness and condemn everyone else, but it's someone that bends to meet people where they are. They serve. That's a servant. Are we truly servants of God? Are we willing to bend so to bring others closer to God? Or are we stubborn, declaring firm righteousness on everyone? These are the Pharisees. They're not like Jesus at all. It's important for us to know God's likeness. Because when we do, then we know what he's calling us into. And when we know what's not like him at all, it's easy for us to also know when we're not acting like him at all or when others are as well. Remember, our fruit exposes where our roots get its nourishment. And uh, Jesus uses that, that analogy over and over and over again. Their fruit will expose where they come from. The third and final, the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. At that time, the disciples said, came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now this, it somewhat exposes the blindness still of the disciples. They're lacking in compassion. And it's all focused on themselves. Very typical of the world. Jesus has just been revealed as God, the Son of God, which is God also. He's worthy of worship. Yet we see how suffering and servanthood are a part of his path that he is to walk and that he is walking. And he just talked about his death, that he's going to die and be raised again. And they want to know who the greatest in the kingdom of heaven is. Other Gospels highlight it so much where they say they were fighting over which one of them was the greatest in heaven. That makes it even worse. It's not so bad in, in this particular text, but either way. So as it is so often with God, with Jesus, his ways are not like ours. But he does reveal himself so that we can embrace the transformation in us, into his ways as it's happening that we don't fight it. That is his call on humanity, is to follow me. If he just came to deal with sin, he would have come, gone to the cross, and left. But his three years of his life were recorded in history for a purpose, for us to understand some things, to learn, to highlight things, and learn how to walk with God, how to be unified with him. So continuing, and calling to him a child. This is the highlight of the whole thing right here. This is what it's all building up to right here. Calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them. And he said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. How many times is child mentioned in there? Three. Three is the number four. Completion, a solid witness. Truly, when he says truly, that's something we always should pay attention to because this is it's basically saying this is an absolute certain fact. 
No doubt. Listen very carefully to what I'm about to say is what he's saying here. So unless you turn, turn here is the same word used back in, in chapter 16, verse 23, where Jesus had to turn to address Peter saying, get behind me, Satan. So it's an idea of repentance, right? Turning. Unless you repent, turn and become like children. Child used here three times, like we already said, never. The word never does not capture how strong this word is. It's a double negative. So what Jesus is basically saying here is you will absolutely never, ever, ever get into heaven unless you turn and change. It's a deal killer. It's important, very important. Child means it's symbol for simplicity, innocence, dependent on the provisions and the protection of a parent can be used to symbolize innocence of evil. Teachability definitely is also there, open. Children know their parents well. They reflect their likeness often, right? You're just like your father, just like your mother. We rub off on them because they're around us. They watch us. It's interesting how much a child picks up, right? Where'd you get that from? <laughs> I'm watching you. Humility, though, is big here. It's an additional quality essential to all of Jesus' followers. Children were expected to be respectful, obedient, and humble in those days. They weren't to be oppressed, but they were to be respectful, obedient, and humble. Honor your mother and your father is a fifth commandment that starts through childhood and goes even through adulthood, period. And God follows it up and he says, so that you will live long in the land because disobedience to your parents is absolute wickedness. It is evil. It is how you learn to do what is right. And disobedience to that actually was death, ultimately. Confronting the Pharisees, Jesus says in Matthew 23, 11 through 12. This is the only two times that this word humble is used in the whole book of Matthew. It says that the greatest among you, now he's going hard at the Pharisees at this point, the woe to you. At one point, I think he even says something along the lines of the what will you do when you're burning in hell kind of a thing. That's pretty, pretty powerful, pretty strong. He's not happy with them at all in this text from Matthew 23. He says, the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Arrogance and disobedience is a character of Satan. Pride. Humility is a character of God. Isn't that the most ironic thing? Because he's the one that owns it all. He's the one that only really deserves all the worship of everything, and yet he's humble. Completely humble. Just look at Jesus. All things were created through him, and yet he came to die and suffer. He serves others. He bends to meet them, not demanding his true royal treatment in this world. Children of God will be in the likeness of their Lord, Jesus. Humble, willing to suffer, willing to serve, and not be served. Definition for humble is marked by meekness, modest in behavior and attitude, not arrogant or prideful, submissive, and respect for others. The Beatitudes, I'm, I'm learning as we're going through this study that Jesus absolutely, after he goes through the Beatitudes, he actually is revealing <laughs> what these Beatitudes even mean afterwards. Each section is taking a bit of the Beatitudes and he's giving it more depth. This one here is where we see it. Matthew 5, 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. How do they inherit it? Through Jesus. 
the meek, the humble. You will turn and be humble like children. The greatest are those who are humble, who serve others and meet a suffering world with compassion and in the likeness of God. Martin Luther, theologian, told a story of two mountain goats. Now clearly this is like a parable, basically. I'm going to assume this wasn't a true story, but I think it paints the picture well for us. Two mountain goats who met each other on a narrow ledge, just wide enough for one of the animals to pass. And on the left was a sheer cliff, on the right was a steep wall. And the two were facing each other, and it was impossible to turn or to back up. So how did they solve this dilemma? If they had been people, they would have started butting each other until they plunged into the chasm together. But according to Luther, the goats had more sense than that. One of them laid down on the trail and let the other literally walk over them. And both were safe. Humility is willing to suffer and to serve. Willing to meet a suffering world because we have the answer to life and to serve. To serve them and to serve their God. Do we embrace humility, dependence on God, faith in His provisions? Because that's the key. What God says, if you do this, I will meet you in those places and I will be your strength in that place. I will be the power behind you. My spirit will live in you in ways that you never knew were possible. So who makes our name great? Is it me? If it is to be, it's up to me. Or is it God? Do we find ourselves identifying with the people of Babel or with Abraham? And if it is Babel, I'm here to tell you that we can change. And that's the call. Repent then. Change. Turn. And embrace God. There is no sin that is too far beyond God's forgiveness. So never think to yourself that God could never forgive what I've done. That's impossible. But we do have to change. We have to repent and follow him. That's faith. It's essential for all Christians to be his children with their heavenly father, to be humble and have faith in his provisions, to face a suffering world, not to turn our back to it, and to serve as Jesus served. He tells us over and over again, it's your life. It's the actions of your life that will tell me where your heart is at, not your mouth. Not your mouth. To see these, God sees these who do humble themselves to God. God sees them. He hears their cries, their call, and he answers them. And his presence goes with them. So the statement or the proposition here today is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven humbly follow in the path and the likeness of Jesus. And this includes suffering and servanthood. For the disciples, it's exactly the opposite of what they're showing. But Jesus is giving them an example so that they know exactly what it looks like. Are we willing to follow Jesus wherever he leads? Because that's his call. Do you trust me? Do you trust me? Because the world is very deceptive. Things aren't the way that they look. Certain things look wonderful, and yet they lead to death. And there are other things, like the call of God to our lives, that look not so appealing, not so exciting. Doesn't look like a great gift. You know, we get it and we poke at it and say, is that alive? Is that even breathing? Can I touch it? And yet, if we're willing to follow that, that path, that is where life is. He says that's also a deception. And the deception will fall down and we'll realize 
that it is life. May we all follow God in the likeness of Jesus, humble, willing to face a suffering world and be servants. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.